Good evening, everybody. You know, there's, uh, there's some subjects that I'm, I feel very inadequate in handling. And the subject tonight is one of those subjects. I just feel before this, this message about the end of time that as a human being, I'm totally inadequate to be able to really present before you the magnitude of this thing and how imperative this message is for each one of us. You know, soon, and I don't know how soon, very few of us will probably be alive that's in this room. And the messages that we have, like the messages tonight, could be, be the most important thing that you ever hear in your life. And, and I just, just feel the awesomeness of these things. I know that the Word of God stands in truth, but the Word of God isn't fully known. And God unrolls the scroll of prophecy. And as it unrolls, there is greater light coming from its pages. That greater light becomes a test for you and for me. If we refuse the tests of the Word of God, He leaves us in darkness and goes on to others. In the middle of the 19th century, God began to give a warning that the time of judgment had come. There were some who received it, but there were far more who didn't. And that's the subject of this amazing chapter in the book of Revelation. The Bible teaches that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Jesus teaches that if we reject His Word, we literally reject Him. And that prophecy is the more sure word in the Bible. If we reject the clear teachings of prophecy, friends, I don't care what denomination you come from. I don't care what creed you come from. I don't care if you were Pope. You would be damned because God would have to go by you and leave you in darkness. This is why I feel so helpless before this tremendous subject, because souls will be tested by its searching truths. We begin in Revelation chapter 10, and I want you to notice the personage that we're talking about is giving the message in this chapter. I saw another angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud. If you look in Revelation chapter 1, if you look in Psalms chapter 18 and other chapters of the Bible, you'll discover that the cloud is a symbol of Christ. This one clothed with a cloud is Jesus Christ, another symbol, and a rainbow was upon his head. Go to the to Genesis, and you'll discover that after the flood, God says, I put my bow, I, I give you this rainbow as a token of my covenant with you. It's a symbol of the covenant of Jesus Christ between the Creator and mankind. This is Jesus that we're talking about. And His face was as it were the, the sun, and His feet as pillars of fire. Study the symbol of feet in the Bible, and feet as fire, and you'll see that a foot is a symbol of authority. They put their feet on their enemy. Jesus ascended to heaven, and there beside the Father, he waits till his enemies be made a footstool. And so we see here fire, a symbol of judgment. This is the one who comes to this earth in judgment and authority, with his face reflecting the glory of the sun and the covenant over his head. This is none other personage than Jesus Christ who's giving the message of this chapter. And so we need to spend a, uh, give a special ear to what's being said here. In verse 2 it says, And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. The sea in the Bible and prophecy that symbolized the islands in the sea, the place where men dwell in the sea, and his foot is on the earth, that means in the continents. So whether it be men that live on the, the, live on the islands of the sea or men who live on the continents, this message is to cover the entire world, and it's coming from Christ. But the message comes out of a little book that is open in his hand. This is crucial. This little book existed in the Old Testament. It is not new. In the Old Testament, the book was sealed. But at this time, Jesus descends from heaven and he says, this book is open. And I want to tell you that that book began to open in the middle of the 19th century. What was it that was closed that is now open? We have to turn back to the ancient book of Daniel. This book that was written over 500 years before the time of Jesus Christ. 
was written by one of the greatest prophets that ever walked on the earth. He walked in the courts of Babylon. His name was Daniel. And at that time, he says, and this is referring to the time of the end, shall Michael stand up. The great prince would stand us for the children of thy people. Michael is the name of Jesus in the Old Testament. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Michael is Christ. And here it says that he's going to stand up at a terrible time of trouble, and he's going to deliver those whose names are written in the book of life. This is a message coming from Michael or from Jesus about the time of judgment. And it began in the middle of the 19th century. Now, verse 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The great resurrection morning is just before us. In verse 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And poor Daniel is reeling at this time, writing almost 600 years before the time of Christ, let alone before the time that you and I live in today, he didn't understand. He wanted to know what these things were that God was passing through him to humanity. But the angel says to him in verse 4, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, knowledge shall be increased. Do men run to and fro today? We can fly between the United States and Europe in three hours today. That was unheard of. It took a month to get across the United States just a hundred years ago. And then if you look closely, it says knowledge shall be increased. Is knowledge increased today? It doubles every few years. Knowledge is increasing. We're living at that time of the end when this book that Daniel had, this, these prophecies of Daniel, are to be unsealed. Let's go back to Revelation. Chapter 10, verse 4. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices. Now what happens is this angel comes down and he holds this book out and he begins to utter out the messages that are in that little book. It says he cried and seven thunders came out of his mouth. A tremendous and a complete powerful message was given to mankind. And then it says, and when, he, and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. What is it? He just re revealed a message. It just came out of his mouth. He revealed it, and then he says, Seal up these messages. Seal them up, John. Don't write these out yet. And then it says, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which therein are, that there should be time no longer. So while the majority of that message was sealed, a message on the end of time is to be revealed at the time this little book is unsealed, at the end of Earth's history. Poor John, you know he experienced these magnificent visions, but like the, the prophet Daniel, he could not have fully comprehended the things that were meant for our time, but you and I can today. And this tells us exactly the time when these things are to take place. In verse 7, it says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. We'd have to turn to the book of Revelation to chapter 11, and there we would read about an angel who blows a trumpet. And he gives this trumpet blast and then there's a view of the nations being angry, the time that the judgment has come, the time that God has come to give the deliverance to the saints. And in this entire time period, Revelation 11, 15 through 19, it says that John in vision saw the time period. He saw in the heavenly sanctuary in vision he saw the tabernacle of the testimony, of the ark of the testimony open in heaven. Now, from the study that we've had, when does that open? It opens just at the end of this earth's history in the time of judgment. This book is to be unveiled at the time of judgment at the end of time. And anyone who rejects this message, friends, will not accept the fact that God is at this point going over those records 
and judging their hearts and souls and will not be ready when he comes in the clouds of heaven. That's how important this thing is. Poor John. He was told by this angel, now I want you to come up, take this book right out of my hand, and I want you to eat the book. And of course, John being obedient did that. But he had a very unfortunate experience. The angel said, take and eat it up, and it shall make your belly bitter, but it shall be in your mouth sweet as honey. Remember that the messages that God had given at this time to John were incomplete. Portions of that book were sealed. Only the portion relating to the time of the end could he actually understand. And so it says, and I looked, took the little book out of the angel's hand, he ate it up, and it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, as it reached his belly, my belly was bitter. He received the message, but it was incomplete. And when it came to the fact of realizing the message, he went to a terrible, bitter experience. But this is to be the experience of God's people at the commencement of the time of the final judgment. They will have an experience, a teaching based upon time, but as they look forward to this time of the end, they'll have a terrible experience as they don't realize the fulfillment of the prophecy that they're anticipating. But after that experience, friends, verse 11, he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. God will give the full prophecy. After disappointment where God sifts and tests his people, you have a pure people to give the full prophecy to the world. And the world better listen because it'll be the voice of God. Now, to understand this little book, we're going to have to go back in time. Now, follow me closely, and this chapter will be very, very clear to you. We have to go back to the time of the children of Israel. God had given them the very highest truths to be given to man through them. Eventually, that little tabernacle that we've been studying, its symbols were taken and incorporated in the most magnificent structure of antiquity, Solomon's temple, 600 feet high. It was one of the great wonders of the world. People gathered from all over the world to worship at the Hebrew temple. Its teachings went everywhere. And throughout the world, clear into China, we know, way into Mongolia and Scythia, Persia, the whole world at that time, many began keeping the seventh-day Sabbath according to the Hebrew custom because of the influence of Solomon's temple and the teachings of it. it. The interior was absolutely magnificent, filled with beautiful artwork, and the most holy place was built over that sacred stone where Abraham offered up his son Isaac where the mosque of Omar is today. Now, God had told these people, he'd given, this was a wonderful time period for them, they never had a greater glory. But God in the past had told them, it shall come to pass that thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. So God promised this blessing only upon the condition of obedience and faithfulness to him. And then Deuteronomy Chapter 28 again, verse 15, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And then it goes through a list of curses to the end of that chapter that gives a verbatim history of what has happened to the Jewish people. Friends, they turned away from God. In what way did they turn away from God? We find in Isaiah chapter 2 that the Jewish people adopted the pagan religions of the world around them and didn't walk that narrow path that God had given them. The prophecy of Jeremiah was because of this apostasy, Jerusalem was to fall to the armies of Babylon. And just before the city fell, he secreted the ark away to a cave, and it's still hidden in that cave today. And then everything broke loose. Everything God had prophesied took place right down to the, to the, the minutia of what he had said. And what had they had done with the prophet Jeremiah? They didn't want to listen to his prophecy. They put him in jail. And he was spared when the city was destroyed. And God's people, those who could have been the head of the nation, now became servants in the great kingdom of Babylon, 
Some of the sons of the kings, the kings were killed and, and the, the princes were taken to Babylon. There they were made into eunuchs. Their heads were shaved. They were forced to study the mystical religions of Babylon so that their line would never again go back to their religion and the belief that these princes, now eunuchs, would never have any progenity and the king of Babylon alone would rule the world forever. That was the plan. But God had a different plan and Daniel, whose mother had educated him at her knee, she had trained him for the possibility of this type of thing, was brought after those three years before the Pontifus Maximus, the great 666 ruler of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. And he tested Daniel on all these mysteries, and you know, he found that lad to be ten times more intelligent than all of his magicians and astrologers of Babylon. God had blessed this young man with wisdom, but he had remained unscathed by the occult teachings of ancient Babylon. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. One night, one morning, he woke up. He was so confused. He had a terrible nightmare. He couldn't remember what, what was in that nightmare, and he invited all of his astrologers to come around. They couldn't answer the question. He commanded that they should die, but Daniel came upon the scene in time. Daniel went and prayed. God gave Daniel the dream. He came before Nebuchadnezzar and he described Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He said, you saw a tremendous image. It had a head of gold. It had a chest and arms of silver, thighs of brass, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. And then you saw a magnificent rock that was cut out without hands. And that rock crushed this statue into fine dust and it was blown away by the wind. And that rock grew into a great mountain that ruled forever. Nebuchadnezzar says, yes, that, that's exactly what I saw. That's exactly the dream. What does it mean? And Daniel says, Babylon, your kingdom, is symbolized by the head of gold. But there's another kingdom coming after you. That kingdom would be Medo-Persia, and that's just what happened. The kingdom that came after that, friends, was another great kingdom. It was the kingdom of Greece. And following the kingdom of Greece, Rome conquered the world in 165 A.D. and ruled the globe for, for one of the largest single periods of time in Earth's history. And then it says that at the end of this time, these, the kingdom of Rome will break up and fragment, mingling of iron and clay. They'll never cleave together again. And that's the world that you and I live in today, a world where the nations just can't get along with each other and they're all broken up. But it's at the time of the end of the world that we're living in today that this rock came and crushed this statue and this rock symbolizing the kingdom of Jesus Christ would swell into a mountain and fill the whole world. Well, you can imagine how overwhelmed Nebuchadnezzar was to hear this. He believed it and he honored Daniel. But he soon forgot. He determined that his kingdom should be forever. And as many of the pagan kings in the past, he, he built a great statue to represent himself and his kingdom, a great golden statue. He ordered all the representatives from all countries to come to him on the plain of Dora and there bow down before that statue. But he found that some of the Hebrews would not bow down. He gave them a second chance or they would be thrown into a great furnace that was set aside there to make the bricks. This furnace was heated seven times hotter, and the test was made. These men said they would not bow down. They worshiped the living God of heaven. When they were thrown in that furnace, the test between the occult teachings and the teachings of the creator of the universe came together, and guess who won? The creator of the universe. And Nebuchadnezzar fell down before these men. He acknowledged a power greater than himself. Another dream, he saw a great tree. He saw creatures under that tree in the shade of it and feeding from it. And when he asked Daniel the meaning of this vision, it was discovered that it represented himself, King Nebuchadnezzar. And this tree was to be cut down. And seven times or seven years was to pass by while it was cut down. And then it would be restored. He would be restored to his power. Well, he acknowledged that the God of heaven was supreme, but again he began to forget he set himself up as God again. He announced that this Babylon was what he had made. And do you know what happened? Just exactly what the prophecy said. He was cut down. 
He became like an animal eating grass for seven years. And then when his wisdom was restored to him, he was a converted man. And I believe Nebuchadnezzar will be in heaven. I believe that he maintained the worship of Yahweh, the ruler of the heavens and the earth, for the rest of his life. And the knowledge of Daniel's God spread throughout the entire world. But this passes through those chapters that show the test between the occult and the true religion of God. And then Daniel describes in the book of Daniel some of the visions that he had himself. Once he was looking out in a vision over a great sea and he saw the wind striving on it represent warfare and strife over the nations. And he saw four great beasts arise. The first one, in verse 4, was like a lion, had eagle's wings. He beheld till the wigs were plucked up and it stood up on its feet like a man and received a man's heart. Babylon would lose its ferocious nature and it would become soft and it would... Uh, it would change in its nature to the nations, which would result in its fall. The next power that take Babylon's place in verse 5 was symbolized by a bear. The bear was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth. Those three ribs represented the nations that the next power took, which was Media and Persia. Media and Persia, joining together, conquered Lydia, Egypt, and Babylon symbolized this movement by the great bear. And then in verse 6, After this I beheld in lo, one that looked like a leopard. And this leopard had wings, and it flew very fast, and it symbolized the great movement of the kingdom of Greece, the next power to take over the earth. And then in verse 7, After these things I saw a night vision, a terrible beast. It was powerful. It had iron teeth. It devoured. It broke everything in pieces. It stomped on everything. It was the most horrible of all the beasts, and it had ten horns. This symbolized the mammoth power of Rome, the iron power that crushed the nations after Greece, and eventually Rome broke up into ten kingdoms. He said in verse 8, I, I continued to watch, I considered, and I noticed that among the ten horns there came up a little horn. It was stronger than the other ones, stouter than the other ones. And behold, this horn had eyes symbolizing intelligence, and it had a mouth that spoke great things. A mouth in prophecy is a symbol of legislative power, speaking things as making laws. Some power would arise in the Roman world making laws. And when it arose, it says that there would be three of the other kingdoms that were plucked up. This is exactly what happened historically. Three of the nations of the Roman world were destroyed in the rise of the new power that took the scepter of the Caesars. And that power was the papal church. And he continued to watch this power continue to exist until the great day of judgment, beginning in verse 9. Daniel saw this, but he did not comprehend what was taking place. And then he saw... Oh, let me go back and let me continue this. And if, he says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was pure as wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, and thousands upon thousands ministered before him. Verse 21, I beheld the same horn made war with God's people, or his saints. He persecuted them and prevailed against them. And he continued to persecute them until... The Ancient of the Days came in this judgment, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints were to receive the kingdom. Now, I could go on in this prophecy. Daniel saw that at the time of the end, when God set in judgment this great, powerful system that had taken over the Roman world and persecuted the true people of God, would eventually pass into the period of judgment and God's people would be delivered. Daniel had another great prophecy that paralleled the same history. But in this prophecy, he was standing on the banks of the river in this vision, and he saw a great goat coming. Now, it was at the time of Babylon, this great goat represented the next, this great ram up above, represented the next power that was going to come. Now, this next power had two horns, again, representing the kings of Media and Persia. It came so fast, it conquered the Babylonian world. And then after it appeared to stand in power, then the next power arose, and Daniel saw it moving so fast that it appeared it didn't even touch the ground. It had a great horn right in the middle that represented its king. That king represented Alexander the Great. And that power conquered and it destroyed the ram. Persia came first. 
and then Alexander the Great came after. All these prophecies have met exact fulfillment. And then when this great big ram, or this great big goat with the big horn, stood in power, having been the conqueror, the horn broke off, and we know that Alexander died. And from that horn, four horns grew out of it towards the four winds of heaven. The kingdom of Greece just broke up towards the four winds of heaven. But the prophecy goes on to say that out of one of those horns, out of one of those areas, came another horn. And that horn began with small beginnings. It was called the little horn. Now let's go right into the prophecy. Verse 10, right at the bottom. No, verse 9. And out of one of them, referring to one of these horns, one of these areas of the kingdom of Grisha, there came out a little horn. The Hebrew is a power from small beginnings, which waxed exceeding great. It grew in power towards the south, towards the east, and towards Palestine or the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. The host of heaven is a symbol of God's church at that time, the Hebrew church. It persecuted them, and it says, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground. It stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. It says even the word to in Hebrew is against. It exalted himself even against Christ, the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifice, it says, was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Look at this verse very closely. It says he exalted himself against Christ. And then it says, by him. And we're talking about the power that exalted itself, the horn. By hor the horn, or the Roman power, the daily, a word that uh, in Hebrew is rum, which means to exalt, to take up, to take, to absorb. It says um, that the Roman power, by him, you're referring to the Roman power, the daily was absorbed or taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. The daily is just a word that means that which continued, that which prevailed, the continuance. And what we know today is that what continued past the Hebrew religion, what conquered it, was a system of pagan idolatry. The daily there represents that Rome absorbed the ancient system of pagan idolatry and it exalted it. And the place of Rome's headquarters, its uh, government was removed, it was cast down. What happened is that the system of Babylonian religion eventually transferred its way to Rome. And the cult of the sun surrounded Caesar. Then what eventually happened is when Constantine came in, he took the headquarters of the Roman sun worshiping religion and transferred it to a different city, to Constantinople. But in its place, another power would arise, verse 12. And in host, or in the marginal reference, it says the host. And here we have a symbol again of God's church. The host was given, the word in Hebrew means to be placed or to be put, against, the word against means against or beside or among. If you look it up, look up the Hebrew word, it means among. The host, God's church, was put among or with the daily, pagan idolatry. The next phrase should be bifasha, or in rebellion, or in transgression. The host, God's church, was put with pagan idolatry in rebellion against God, and it, this new uh, abomination, cast the truth to the ground, and it practiced, and it prospered. Some power would sit upon the Roman throne. It would be an amalgamation of paganism and Christianity. The result would be the great system that um, would persecute God's church and eventually have to face that judgment at the end of time. And John, uh, Daniel is seeing a vision in heaven. He says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision, the daily, and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. How long with this terrible apostasy, this terrible confusion of pagan ideas and false Christian ideas continue to trample upon the truths and God's true people? And the answer comes in verse 14. And he said unto me, in the marginal reference, you can see it right there, right, look at the, um, just above 14, 
go up to the word sanctuary and go along that line and you'll see the name Palmoni. See that? Palmoni is one of the names of Jesus Christ. The one who is talking in verse 14 is Christ. And he's saying, he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, what's the cleansing of the sanctuary? The word cleansing means to be restored, cleansed, or vindicated. That symbolized the time. Now, we've studied in the Hebrew sanctuary that at the end of the ceremonial year, the priest took a special blood of that goat, the Lord's goat, and went to the sanctuary and cleansed it. This gives us an actual time period of when that time of judgment would commence. And it's the longest time period in the Bible, and it's the most explicit. It comes with evidences of its own. I'll show you that in a minute. Rome conquered the world. It took over everything, just as the prophecy had described. It actually was the one who nailed Christ to the cross, and it fulfilled all these prophecies. And then the Christian church eventually apostatized and took over the throne of Rome, became the Roman Christian church in exact fulfillment of the prophecy that, that Daniel saw. But poor Daniel was so far removed from it, he was in absolute confusion over what he was seeing. He could not see our day. He was only to be a medium to bring these messages to us. So in verse 27 it says, And I, Daniel, fainted. I was sick certain days. Afterwards I rose up and I did the king's business and I was astonished at the vision, but I didn't understand it. I wanted to understand it, but I couldn't. Poor Daniel. In the next chapter, chapter 9, Daniel is on his knees and is pleading with God for the forgiveness of the sins of his people and pleading for understanding. Wanted to understand the vision. God sent a magnificent angel from heaven, who arrived there from the courts of heaven, and uh, he arrived beside Daniel, and he announced to Daniel that he had come to explain the vision to Daniel. And he said, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So seventy weeks. How long is seventy weeks? Let's look at verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So there's another time prophecy of seven weeks and 62 weeks. And then verse 26, And after threescore and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince shall come that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the, end shall be, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end war and desolations are determined. It, this prophecy has made very little sense to people through the years. And yet this is what the angel says is the explanation of Daniel's vision. The angel said to him first, O oh, Daniel, I am now come to give you skill and understanding. Therefore understand the vision. What vision is he talking about? In, in, in Daniel 9, he's talking about the vision of Daniel 8. The vision that said, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, how long of a period are we talking about? Well, in Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34, we read that God has used a symbolism in prophecy of a day for a year. So we're talking about a time period of 2,300 years in the message of Daniel chapter 8. But now with the explanation in chapter 9, let's reread that explanation in a way that makes a little more sense. The Hebrew people wrote in a form of poetry. Daniel wrote in the same form of poetry and prophecy. The prophecies that he's writing about in Daniel chapter 9 are actually two prophecies put together. Notice how these work together. Prophecy A is referring to the Messiah, the prince that's to come. And it says, So you are now to understand or discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And then the second prophecy, it says the city to be rebuilt, it will be built again and the plaza and the moat even in troublous times. Two prophecies. One concerning when the Messiah is going to come and one concerning the, the rebuilding of the city. 
Now let's go to the next verse. It says, after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And then he shifts over to the second prophecy, saying, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood, even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. So one prophecy is talking about the Messiah. The second prophecy is talking about the building and the destruction of Jerusalem. And then going back to the prophecy about the Messiah, it says, and he will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to it, a stop to the covenant. That's referring to the Messiah. He'll bring a stop to the sacrifice and the grain offerings. That's a system of the sanctuary. Remember, Christ nailed that system to the cross when he died. Then it goes back to the other prophecy, and, and it says, and on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate, even unto the completion, complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So two prophecies. Let's look closely. The entire prophecy begins with the issue to restore Jerusalem. You'll find this in Ezra. The book of Ezra, the story of Ezra, talks about Artaxerxes finally passing a law to restore the children of Israel back to their land. Two laws had gone out before this, but Artaxerxes finished those laws and made complete opportunity for the sanctuary to be finished and for the entire system of its government to be restored. That law went forth in 457. Now we have the beginning of the 2300-year prophecy. But in the prophecy it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So 70 weeks of this 2300-year prophecy is for the Hebrew people. 70 weeks is 490 days. That means that 490 years of the 2300 years is determined for the Hebrew people to fulfill their prophecies, to do their work, to fulfill the mission God has given them to do. If you add 490 years to the beginning of this prophecy in 457, you come to A.D. 34. A.D. 34. Now let's look at the other part of this prophecy. Seven weeks, after seven weeks and 62 weeks, it said the Messiah would come, or unto the Messiah. That's 49 days plus 434 days. It comes to... 483 days, which in years is 483 years. So you have two prophecies beginning with the, prof the, uh, the law that went forth to restore Jerusalem in 457. One of them is 483 years long. It comes to A.D. 27. The other is 490 years long. It comes to A.D. 34. And so you have a week of years here between the end of one prophecy when the Messiah is to make his appearance and the end of the other prophecy when Israel is to be cut off. And it said, in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. That in the midst of the week is A.D. 31. Friends, that's the exact year that Jesus died upon the cross. And what happened in A.D. 27? Jesus was baptized that very year. We know the exact year of that because of events that transpired in the legal system of Rome in that very year. That's announced in Luke chapter 1. Jesus was anointed. That's what the word Messiah means. He was anointed by the Spirit in A.D. 27, a perfect fulfillment of this prophecy. Jesus even went forth from that moment announcing that the time was fulfilled. If the Hebrew people had been studying their prophecies, they would have known exactly where they were in history. And what happened in A.D. 34? When Israel was to be cut off, we find that Jesus did not cut them off. When he ascended to heaven, he told his disciples to go first to the lost of the house of Israel. In 34 A.D., the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem began a terrifying persecution of the Christians in Jerusalem and forced them from their country. And at that time, the... Uh, Israel came to its close. Exactly 34 A.D. is the very year that the Apostle Paul received the commission to go to the Gentile world with the message. Perfect fulfillment of prophecy. Every single part of this prophecy, the Messiah being cut off in the middle of it, everything was fulfilled. This is the most profound prophecy in the Bible. There's absolutely nothing of this prophecy that hasn't reached its fulfillment. It's evidence, friends. This is real evidence. This isn't some psychic phenomenon, some mystical teaching of something that may come or may happen in the future. This is tangible evidence 
that this prophecy is very, very real. But where were the Jews during all this? Why weren't they studying these prophecies? Why didn't they know what was going on? When they were in Babylon, they, many of these, in the Sanhedrin, adopted the occult teachings of Babylon, and they were totally confused as to its teaching. They wrote a number of mystical books. They set up colleges there in Babylon to study the mysteries of the occult and to unite it with the... Uh, with the Hebrew religion. They couldn't understand uh, Jesus. They couldn't understand these prophecies of the Old Testament. Look, this is supposed to be the Tetragrammaton, the name of Yahweh. And notice that there are 10 numbers in that. Those 10 numbers symbolize our 10 uh, letters. Those 10 letters, giving the full name of God according to these people, represent all the teachings of the astrological and the occult gods behind this mystery. And notice too, again, down below there, just below the letters, it says the great name of God equals 72. 72 is 36 twice. 36 is six times six twice. What they did was they took the name of God and they, they gave the Hebrew name to the 666 God that ruled the zodiac. And they also called it a he-she God, a God that was both male and female. They wouldn't even announce the name of this God. And these priests and these leaders worshiped this religion while they taught what they considered to be a profane religion, the religion of the Hebrews to the common man, this to protect and to keep their power. They were in absolute confusion. And when Jesus came to, to die and to fulfill the prophecy, as that little donkey of his came up over the hill, and he looked out over Jerusalem, and there were literally thousands of people on the hills, probably millions, gathering around Jerusalem, announcing that he was the Messiah. Some were waving palm branches and throwing their cloaks down before him. His donkey stopped. He looked out over the hill at Jerusalem. And as he looked at it, some change came over him. He began to rock to and fro on that donkey. And a superhuman agony came over his face. His eyes began to fill with tears. The people could not understand what was taking place in his heart. But just seeing his superhuman agony, many of them began to weep with him. They couldn't understand the sorrow of the Savior because he began to wail. Christ was seeing a vision of the destruction of Jerusalem and his people who he came to save. And he could look down into the future in this vision and he could see the suffering and the death of those who would reject the wonderful messages of truth. And so he cried out, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings and ye would not? Matthew 23, 37. And the next verse after this says that your house is left unto you desolate. It broke Christ's heart. He realized that his people would reject him and the prophecies, the literal prophecies of the Old Testament to the establishing of Israel would now not be fulfilled in a literal way, but it would be long centuries before the fulfillment of the purposes of God in behalf of the human race. As a result of this, years later in 70 AD, the ruler Titus came in and destroyed Jerusalem absolutely destroyed it in every prophecy of Jesus that one stone would not be left upon another was absolutely fulfilled Do you realize that when the Roman soldiers went into that city and they saw the gold coming down through the rocks uh, Melting down through those stones in the temple that they pulled those stones apart and they plowed the entire hill of the temple There was not one stone left standing on another in exact fulfillment of Christ's prophecy And then in 135 AD the Roman soldiers came back again and they did it to the entire city It was just mowed down and the Hebrew people weren't allowed to go back into their city again we have on the Arch of Titus in Rome today uh, a relief showing that Titus took the actual implements and furniture of the temple and took it back to Rome. We don't know where these are today, but they were taken back to Rome and God's prophecies were fulfilled of the destruction of Jerusalem. And those poor people, their house left unto them desolate, they received a wonderful knowledge of truth. They received the prophecies of God, but they rejected them. They had them, but they rejected them. And the result is, just as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says as they look at the word of God now, as they look into the law of Moses, there's a veil over their faces. They don't understand Jesus. 
Here you have a structure of the sanctuary and its prophecies with no Jesus Christ to fulfill it. It's empty. It's void. And it's, it's one of the saddest things in the history of the earth is to see the Hebrew people without a Messiah when the Messiah has already come. This is in Jerusalem. It's the center of one of the early meeting places of the Sanhedrin. That Sanhedrin still meets today. But these people don't understand. They're trying desperately through their financial dynasties to conquer the world to set up the messianic kingdom for the Messiah when he comes. And believe me, they've gone a long way to fulfilling this. But the religion is empty. It's void. And the masses of the Hebrew people today have an empty religion. They're still pleading for the Messiah that's coming. It must be quite an experience to stand by the wailing wall and watch these people approach this last little vestige of the, of the old Jerusalem, putting little notes or little prayers into the, uh, the cracks in the rocks and just pleading for their Messiah to come. They can't seem to understand why everything has gone wrong. But they just need to read their prophecy. They rejected the Messiah. They didn't understand the prophecy. Jesus says in 1 Samuel 15, 23, Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also rejected thee. It's so clear, isn't it? We can't toy around with these prophecies. They've got to be acknowledged. They've got to be studied. They've got to be accepted. And they have to be acted upon or we'll be lost and left empty like the Hebrew people. Now let's go to the end of the 2300-year prophecy. 457, Artaxerxes' de decree. Add 2300 years. And it brings you to the middle of the 19th century, the very time when God was moving through the mouths of little children to announce that the judgment hour had come. It was a supernatural movement by angels of God to announce that the judgment of this world was commencing in 1844. Now, Daniel said that knowledge would increase. He said that men would run to and fro. Here we find an exact fulfillment now of the long-range prophecies of the Hebrew sanctuary. If the day of judgment or the day of atonement, as we've studied in the last few nights, was to begin in 1844 then we should see the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets take place 10 days earlier, shouldn't we? We would have to. God would have to have a fulfillment of that prophecy. 10 days in prophecy is 10 years. We have to go back to the year 1833. What was happening in the early 1830s? Well, <clears throat> we find that a magnificent book was published that caused a tremendous... Uh, uh, a tremendous revival in the belief in Jesus coming in England and in Europe. It was called the coming of Christ in glory and majesty. Lacunza, at the opening of the 19th century, years earlier, was a Jesuit of a monastery in South America. He became converted to Protestantism. He diligently studied his Bible, and he gave special attention to prophecy. He became so aroused by this 2,300-year period, as indicated, that... Uh, as indicating that the promised return of Christ was not far distant, that he attempted to write a book on the subject, but he was persecuted. He fled Chile. He ended up in Italy. He wrote under the pen name of Rabbi Ben Ezra to avoid persecution. And I went to England. I went into the Lambeth Palace Library there, and by the grace of God, we found the books that this man had written, and we read them. And I was so amazed to see one of the descriptions of the coming of Christ after another proved false by his study of Scripture, and then the magnificent prophecy of the 2300 days, just as we're studying here, laid out before my eyes. This man, persecuted by his own Roman Catholic Church for what he was discovering, was one of those that was being moved upon by the Spirit of God to give this message that the judgment of God was coming. About the same time, a man named Edward Irving began his astonishing labors along the same line in England and in Scotland. He too, after his, his call from Scotland in 1812 to become the leading preacher in London, applied himself increasingly to the study of prophecy, concentrating especially upon the 2300-year time period of Daniel 8:14. He arrived at practically the same conclusion at Lacunza. It says that that tremendous crowds attended his lectures, not only in London, but throughout the large cities of Great Britain. Auditoriums were not large enough to accommodate those who sought to hear him. His, frame reached, his fame reached the ears of Lacunza, who sent him a copy of his own book. Irving was astonished to see how God had separately led the Scotch Presbyterian and the converted South American Jew to recognize the commanding value of this prophecy and to conclude from it that the time of the end had come. But 
This is, to me, the most intriguing man of all. His name was, his, his Christian name later given to him was Joseph. His Jewish name was Wolf. He was a son of a leading rabbi. He studied to be a Roman Catholic, and he had aspirations of becoming the Pope. And it's an amazing thing how he found Jesus. If you want to read the most fascinating history of any of the most brilliant genius in history, study the history of Joseph Wolf. According to his journals, between the years 1821 and 1845, proclaimed the Lord's speedy advent in Palestine, Egypt, the shores of the Red Sea, Mesopotamia, Crimea, Persia, Georgia, throughout the Ottoman Empire, in Greece, Arabia, Turkestan, Bukhara, Afghanistan, Kashmir, Hindustan, Tibet, Holland, Scotland, Ireland, Constantinople, Jerusalem, St. Helena, also on shipboard in the Mediterranean and at New York City. This was quite a man. This was quite a man. He spent his life, sometimes he was stripped naked and he was being dragged through the snows. Sometimes he wandered in the mountains lost for days on end. He spoke to the Mohammedans. He spoke to the Turkestans. He spoke to them, and the message was presented during the very years that we're talking about. The converted South American Jew, the Scotch Presbyterian, and the converted son of the rabbi were followed in study and preaching of the same pivotal prophecy by a man named William Miller, who was an American farmer, a veteran of the War of 1812, a converted infidel. Later, he was ordained a Baptist preacher, and he, and he stirred to their foundation, the Churches of America, during the years 1828 and 1844. There's that time period. He has never yet been surpassed in giving to the world an original and generally correct analysis of the prophetic period. He presented the 2300-day prophecies. Friends, in the early 30s, this message was going throughout the entire world. It is unprecedented in history as a religious movement Many of you have never realized this before. You belong, many of you, to, to religious systems who've rejected the message that was given in the middle of the 19th century by angels and by men that were moved upon by God. These men didn't represent any single denomination. They were men out of the Baptist, Presbyterian. They came out of Judaism, came out of Catholicism, and they were presenting this before the world at that time. We find that even among the Negro slaves in the United States, Negroes are rising up and preaching the 2300-day prophecy that we've studied tonight in fulfillment of that. That 2300-day prophecy, these people did not understand fully what was to happen at the end of that prophecy. They believed that this earth was to be purified by fire at the coming of Jesus Christ. And as thousands, thousands upon thousands all over the world gathered to await the coming of Christ in 1844. Some of them got so excited about it they even bought uh, white robes and stood in the tops of trees. They were so convicted. Many of them left the food in their gardens, left the potatoes in the field. They left everything in this life. They were scoffed at by infidels. But they knew that the prophetic time period was true. There was no denying it, and there were so many miracles to attest to this that they couldn't deny it, or they would have believed that they were denying Jesus Christ. What were they to do then in 1844 when it didn't happen? That little book that was opening, a portion of that message was sealed, friends. That book in the angel's hand. And as John took that me message and he ate it, so these people took that message and they studied it and they ate it. And then when they came to 1844, it became bitter in their stomach as Jesus did not come and they didn't understand what happened. Oh, the world scoffed at them. But I wouldn't scoff at these people. I wouldn't laugh at these people because they were living out their sincerest convictions and they loved Jesus with all of their heart and were willing to give up this world just to go home with him. But the sadness did not last forever because just as the prophecy says that you are to go and prophesy again before, before the world, Jesus opened up an understanding of what we have studied in the last few nights, friends, and that is that the ancient Hebrew sanctuary is only a pattern, only a type of the heavenly sanctuary, and that the day of the investigative judgment is a day when God begins his sealing work. He begins his work of judgment in man's behalf, and that time began in 1844, and that's clear testimony from the word of God. What happened to those churches that laughed at them and scoffed at them and clung to their creeds? Friends, they've been left behind in darkness. God is looking for people with an honest, open heart who will study that word for themselves and believe the truth because Jesus said it and not because a priest or a pastor or a church said it. 
And that's the most important thing I could tell you tonight, friends. This prophecy is so clear. The decree went forth in 457. In A.D. 27, Jesus was baptized. In A.D. 34, the gospel went to the Gentile world. Everything has been perfectly fulfilled. And friends, just as all the tangible, physical evidence has been fulfilled, in 1844, Jesus began his ministry as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. And there is a way open into the holiest of all now through our high priest, Jesus Christ, to receive the fullness of what Jesus has to give in preparing a people to meet their God. And we're closer to that moment than we could ever imagine before. I don't know how long, days, months, years, I don't know how long. But I know that we can't procrastinate at this time. We've got to come boldly to Christ. This is the most mysterious and far-reaching chapter in the book of Revelation. The messages that went forth were called the three angels' messages, and you can read them in Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse 6. And the first message is that the gospel of God is to go to the whole world. And it says, worship the Creator. And it says, because the hour of His judgment is come. At the end of this judgment, I don't know how soon, all I know is that the prophecy says that when Jesus comes, every decision will be made. He will come to render to every man according to His works. That means He's had to decide for every man before He comes to this earth. We need to recognize that because for the majority of people in this world, Jesus will come as a thief. They will not know when he comes, and it will be forever too late if they haven't prepared beforehand. Before Jesus leaves the heavenly sanctuary, he announces, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Jesus will seal his people into his love for eternity. And those who will not accept his love, those who procrastinate in this magnificent invitation of mercy from the creator of the universe to enter into his joy, will be sealed out for eternity. And I beg you, I beg you in the name of Jesus to not let that happen to you. Christ is desperately today trying to reach out to you. He's saying to walk through the courts of heaven, you have to be obedient to my commandments. He says, I want to point you to my law, which is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary where I'm ministering today. That law has ten commandments on it. In each one of those laws, I will write it upon your heart. Just turn to me. Confess your sins and I will give you my law. One of the last things he says is, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. No, friends, I know that our high priest wants to invite you home. He just cannot stand the thought of you being lost. He's given absolutely everything he has. The Father has given his only Son. Jesus has given his life. The Holy Spirit has dedicated himself to bringing these things before your mind and before your heart. Because Jesus wants to enjoy your fellowship throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. You know, it's so hard at this point to, to try to bring to your minds the fact that this prophecy is historical fact. It is evidence. And it, we'd like to just kind of shove it off. Wait, that can't be happening. A judgment going on now to decide my eternal destiny? Wait, I don't want that to happen right now. It's happening anyway, friends. And if you're lost in this time period, all of eternity isn't going to straighten that mistake out. I just beg you in the name of Jesus to take this Bible and study it like you have never studied it before. This is your chance. Don't blow it. Jesus is coming soon. In the, in the nights ahead, I'm going to take you through the prophecies of Revelation, and you're going to discover that almost every single prophecy has met exact fulfillment, and we right now are at the end of this judgment hour. Please listen to what I'm saying. Get ready to meet your God is my prayer tonight for you. Let's, 
bow our heads together, shall we? <clears throat> Dear Father, we come before Thee and we thank Thee for the privilege of being able to speak to the ruler of the universe. I pray for each one here, dear Lord, that thy spirit will move upon their hearts to show them the seriousness of the times and to reveal your unfathomable love and to let the things of this earth grow just totally dim in the light of your glory. Dear Lord, may not one of these souls be lost when you make up your kingdom as you come soon. These things I pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.